everyone! Today, the bookworms are going to be reading Charlotte's Web, written by E.B. White and pictures by Garth Williams. Chapter number one, Before Breakfast. Where's Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. Out to the hog house, replied Mrs. Arable. Some pigs were born last night. I don't see why he needs an axe, continued Fern, who was only eight. Well, said her mother, one of the pigs is a runt. It's very small and weak, and it will never amount to anything. So your father has decided to do away with it. Do away with it? shrieked Fern. You mean kill it? Just because it's smaller than the others? Mrs. Arable put a pitcher of cream on the table. Don't yell, Fern, she said. Your father is right. The pig would probably die anyway. Fern pushed a chair out of the way and ran outdoors. The grass was wet and the earth smelled of springtime. Fern's sneakers were sopping by the time she caught up with her father. Please don't kill it, she sobbed. It's unfair. Mr. Arable stopped walking. Fern, he said gently, you will have to learn to control yourself. Control myself? yelled Fern. This is a matter of life and death, and you talk about controlling myself? Tears ran down her cheeks, and she took hold of the axe and tried to pull it out of her father's hand. Fern, said Mr. Arable, I know more about raising a litter of pigs than you do. A weakling makes trouble. Now run along! But it's unfair, cried Fern. The pig couldn't help being born small, could it? If I had been very small at birth, would you have killed me? Mr. Arable smiled. Certainly not, he said, looking down at his daughter with love. But this is different. A little girl is one thing, a little runty pig is another. I see no difference, replied Fern, still hanging on to the axe. This is the most terrible case of injustice I ever heard of. A queer look came over John Arable's face. He seemed almost ready to cry himself. All right, he said. You go back to the house and I'll bring the runt when I come in. I'll let you start it on a bottle like a baby. Then you'll see what trouble a pig can be. When Mr. Arable returned to the house half an hour later, he carried a carton under his arm. Fern was upstairs changing her sneakers. The kitchen table was set for breakfast, and the room smelled of coffee, bacon, damp plaster, and wood smoke from the stove. Put it on her chair, said Mrs. Arable. Mr. Arable set the carton down at Fern's place. Then he walked to the sink and washed his hands and dried them on the roller towel. Fern came slowly down the stairs. Her eyes were red from crying. As she approached her chair, the carton wobbled, and there was a scratching noise. Fern looked at her father. Then she lifted the lid of the carton. There, inside, looking up at her, was a newborn pig. It was a white one. The morning light shone through its ears, turning them pink. He's yours, said Mr. Arable, saved from an untimely death, and may the good Lord forgive me for this foolishness. Fern couldn't take her eyes off the tiny pig. Oh, she whispered. Oh, look at him. He's absolutely perfect. She closed the carton carefully. First, she kissed her father. Then she kissed her mother. Then she opened the lid again, lifted the pig out, and held it against her cheek. At this moment, her brother Avery came into the room. Avery was ten. He was heavily armed, an air rifle in one hand a wooden dagger in the other. What's that? he demanded. What's Fern got? She's got a guest for breakfast, said Mrs. Arable. Wash your hands and face, Avery. Let's see it, said Avery, setting his gun down. You call that miserable thing a pig? That's a fine specimen of a pig. It's no bigger than a white rat. Wash up and eat your breakfast, Avery, said his mother. The school bus will be along in half an hour. Can I have a pig too, Pop? asked Avery. No, I only distribute pigs to early risers, said Mr. Arable. Fern was up at daylight trying to rid the world of injustice.
As a result, she now has a pig. A small one, to be sure, but nevertheless a pig. It just shows what can happen if a person gets out of bed promptly. Let's eat! But Fern couldn't eat until her pig had had a drink of milk. Mrs. Arable found a baby's nursing bottle and a rubber nipple. She poured warm milk into the bottle, fitted the nipple over the top, and handed it to Fern. Give him his breakfast, she said. A minute later, Fern was seated on the floor in the corner of the kitchen with her infant between her knees, teaching it to suck from the bottle. The pig, although tiny, had a good appetite and caught on quickly. The school bus honked from the road. Run! commanded Mrs. Arable, taking the pig from Fern and slipping a donut into her hand. Avery grabbed his gun and another donut. The children ran out to the road and climbed into the bus. Fern took no notice of the others in the bus. She just sat and stared out of the window, thinking what a blissful world it was and how lucky she was to have entire charge of a pig. By the time the bus reached school, Fern had named her pet, selecting the most beautiful name she could think of. Its name is Wilbur, she whispered to herself. She was still thinking about the pig when the teacher said, Fern, what is the capital of Pennsylvania? Wilbur, replied Fern dreamily. The pupils giggled. Fern blushed. Chapter 2 Wilbur Fern loved Wilbur more than anything. She loved to stroke him, to feed him, to put him to bed. Every morning, as soon as she got up, she warmed his milk, tied his bib on, and held the bottle for him. Every afternoon, when the school bus stopped in front of her house, she jumped out and ran to the kitchen to fix another bottle for him. She fed him again at supper time, and again just before going to bed. Mrs. Arable gave him a feeding around noontime each day when Fern was away in school. Wilbur loved his milk and he was never happier than when Fern was warming up a bottle for him. He would stand and gaze up at her with adoring eyes. For the first few days of his life, Wilbur was allowed to live in a box near the stove in the kitchen. Then, when Mrs. Arable complained, he was moved to a bigger box in the woodshed. At two weeks of age, he was moved outdoors. It was apple blossom time, and the days were getting warmer. Mr. Arable fixed a small yard specially for Wilbur under an apple tree and gave him a large wooden box full of straw with a doorway cut in it so he could walk in and out as he pleased. Won't he be cold at night? asked Fern. No, said her father. You watch and see what he does. Carrying a bottle of milk, Fern sat down under the apple tree inside the yard. Wilbur ran to her and she held the bottle for him while he sucked. When he had finished the last drop, he grunted and walked sleepily into the box. Fern peered through the door. Wilbur was poking the straw with his snout. In a short time, he had dug a tunnel in the straw. He crawled into the tunnel and disappeared from sight, completely covered with straw. Fern was enchanted. It relieved her mind to know that her baby would sleep covered up and would stay warm. Every morning, after breakfast, Wilbur walked out to the road with Fern and waited with her till the bus came. She would wave goodbye to him, and he would stand and watch the bus until it vanished around a turn. While Fern was in school, Wilbur was shut up inside his yard. But as soon as she got home in the afternoon, she would take him out and he would follow her around the place. If she went into the house, Wilbur went too. If she went upstairs, Wilbur would wait at the bottom step until she came down again. If she took her doll for a walk in the doll carriage, Wilbur followed along. Sometimes, on these journeys, Wilbur would get tired, and Fern would pick him up and put him in the carriage alongside the doll. He liked this, and if he was very tired, he would close his eyes and go to sleep under the doll's blanket. He looked cute when his eyes were closed because his lashes were so long. The doll would close her eyes too, and Fern would wheel the carriage very slowly and smoothly so as not to wake her infants. One warm afternoon, Fern and Avery put on bathing suits and went down to the brook for a swim. Wilbur tagged along at Fern's heels. 
When she waded into the brook, Wilbur waded in with her. He found the water quite cold, too cold for his liking. So while the children swam and played and splashed water at each other, Wilbur amused himself in the mud along the edge of the brook, where it was warm and moist and delightfully sticky and oozy. Every day was a happy day, and every night was peaceful. Wilbur was what farmers call a spring pig, which simply means that he was born in springtime. When he was five weeks old, Mr. Arable said he was now big enough to sell, and would have to be sold. Fern broke down and wept, but her father was firm about it. Wilbur's appetite had increased; he was beginning to eat scraps of food in addition to milk. Mr. Arable was not willing to provide for him any longer. He had already sold Wilbur's ten brothers and sisters. He's got to go, Fern," he said. "You have had your fun raising a baby pig, but Wilbur is not a baby any longer, and he has got to be sold." "Call up the Zuckermans," suggested Mrs. Arable to Fern. "Your uncle Homer sometimes raises a pig, and if Wilbur goes there to live, you can walk down the road and visit him as often as you like." How much money should I ask for him? Fern wanted to know. Well, said her father, he's a runt. Tell your uncle Homer you've got a pig you'll sell for six dollars and see what he says. It was soon arranged. Fern phoned and got her aunt Edith, and her aunt Edith hollered for Uncle Homer. And Uncle Homer came in from the barn and talked to Fern. When he heard that the price was only six dollars, he said he would buy the pig. Next day, Wilbur was taken from his home under the apple tree, and went to live in a manure pile in the cellar of Zuckerman's barn. Chapter Number Three: Escape. The barn was very large. It was very old. It smelled of hay and it smelled of manure. It smelled of the perspiration of tired horses and the wonderful sweet breath of patient cows. It often had a sort of peaceful smell. As though nothing bad could happen ever again in the world, it smelled of grain and of harness dressing, and of axle grease and of rubber boots and of new rope. And whenever the cat was given a fish head to eat, the barn would smell of fish. But mostly it smelled of hay, for there was always hay in the great loft up overhead, and there was always hay being pitched down to the cows and the horses and the sheep. The barn was pleasantly warm in winter, when the animals spent most of their time indoors, and it was pleasantly cool in summer, when the big doors stood wide open to the breeze. The barn had stalls on the main floor for the workhorses, tie-ups on the main floor for the cows, a sheepfold down below for the sheep, a pig pen down below for Wilbur, and it was full of all sorts of things you find in barns. Ladders, grindstones, pitchforks, monkey wrenches, sides, lawn mowers, snow shovels, axe handles, milk pails, water buckets, empty grain sacks, and rusty rat traps. It was the kind of barn that swallows like to build their nests in. It was the kind of barn that children like to play in, and the whole thing was owned by Fern's uncle, Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman. Wilbur's new home was in the lower part of the barn, directly underneath the cows. Mr. Zuckerman knew that a manure pile is a good place to keep a young pig. Pigs need warmth, and it was warm and comfortable down there in the barn cellar on the south side. Fern came almost every day to visit him. She found an old milking stool that had been discarded, and she placed the stool in the sheepfold next to Wilbur's pen. Here she sat quietly during the long afternoons, thinking and listening and watching Wilbur. The sheep soon got to know her and trust her. So did the geese who lived with the sheep. All the animals trusted her. She was so quiet and friendly. Mr. Zuckerman did not allow her to take Wilbur out, and he did not allow her to get into the pig pen. But he told Fern that she could sit on the stool and watch Wilbur as long as she wanted to. It made her happy just to be near the pig, and it made Wilbur happy to know that she was sitting there right outside his pen. But he never had any fun, no walks, no rides, no swims. One afternoon in June, when Wilbur was almost two months old, 
he wandered out into his small yard outside the barn. Fern had not arrived for her usual visit. Wilbur stood in the sun, feeling lonely and bored. There's never anything to do around here, he thought. He walked slowly to his food trough and sniffed to see if anything had been overlooked at lunch. He found a small strip of potato skin and ate it. His back itched, so he leaned against the fence and rubbed against the boards. When he tired of this, he walked indoors, climbed to the top of the manure pile, and sat down. He didn't feel like going to sleep. He didn't feel like digging. He was tired of standing still, tired of lying down. I'm less than two months old, and I'm tired of living, he said. He walked out to the yard again. When I'm out here, he said, there's no place to go but in. When I'm indoors, there's no place to go but out in the yard. That's where you're wrong, my friend, my friend, said a voice. Wilbur looked through the fence and saw the goose standing there. You don't have to stay in that dirty little, dirty little, dirty little yard, said the goose, who talked rather fast. One of the boards is loose. Push on it, push on it, push, push, push on it, and come on out. What? said Wilbur. Say it slower. At, 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 at the risk of repeating myself, said the goose, I suggest that you come on out. It's wonderful out here. Did you say a board was loose? That I did, that I did, said the goose. Wilbur walked up to the fence and saw that the goose was right. One board was loose. He put his head down, shut his eyes, and pushed. The board gave way. In a minute, he had squeezed through the fence and was standing in the long grass outside his yard. The goose chuckled. How does it feel to be free? she asked. I like it, said Wilbur. That is, I guess, I like it. Actually, Wilbur felt queer to be outside his fence, with nothing between him and the big world. Where do you think I'd better go? Anywhere you like, anywhere you like, said the goose. Go down through the orchard, root up the sod, go down through the garden, dig up the radishes, root up everything, eat grass, look for corn, look for oats, run all over, skip and dance, jump and prance, go down through the orchard and stroll in the woods. The world is a wonderful place when you're young. I can see that, replied Wilbur. He gave a jump in the air, twirled, ran a few steps, stopped, looked all around, sniffed the smells of afternoon, and then set off walking down through the orchard. Pausing in the shade of an apple tree, he put his strong snout into the ground and began pushing, digging and rooting. He felt very happy. He had plowed up quite a piece of ground before anyone noticed him. Mrs. Zuckerman was first to see him. She saw him from the kitchen window, and she immediately shouted for the men. Homer! She cried, Pigs out! Larvae! Pigs out! Homer! Larvae! Pigs out! He's down there under that apple tree. Now the trouble starts, thought Wilbur. Now I'll catch it. The goose heard the racket and she too started hollering, Run! 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 Downhill! Make for the woods! The woods! She shouted to Wilbur, They'll never, never, never catch you in the woods! The cocker spaniel heard the commotion, and he ran out from the barn to join the chase. Mr. Zuckerman heard, and he came out of the machine shed where he was mending a tool. Lurvy, the hired man, heard the noise and came up from the asparagus patch where he was pulling weeds. Everybody walked toward Wilbur, and Wilbur didn't know what to do. The woods seemed a long way off, and anyway, he had never been down there in the woods and wasn't sure he would like it. Get around behind him, Lurvy! said Mr. Zuckerman, and drive him toward the barn. And take it easy, don't rush him. I'll go and get a bucket of slops. The news of Wilbur's escape spread rapidly among the animals on the place. Whenever any creature broke loose on Zuckerman's farm, the event was of great interest to the others. The goose shouted to the nearest cow that Wilbur was free, and soon all the cows knew. Then one of the cows told one of the sheep, and soon all the sheep knew. The lambs learned about it from their mothers. The horses in their stalls in the barn pricked up their ears when they heard the goose hollering, and soon the horses had caught on to what was happening. 
Wilbur's out, they said. Every animal stirred and lifted its head and became excited to know that one of his friends had got free and was no longer penned up or tied fast. Wilbur didn't know what to do or which way to run. It seemed as though everybody was after him. If this is what it's like to be free, he thought, I believe I'd rather be penned up in my own yard. The cocker spaniel was sneaking up on him from one side. Lurvy, the hired man, was sneaking up on him from the other side. Mrs. Zuckerman stood ready to head him off if he started for the garden, and now Mr. Zuckerman was coming down toward him carrying a pail. This is really awful, thought Wilbur. Why doesn't Fern come? He began to cry. The goose took command and began to give orders. Don't just stand there, Wilbur! Dodge about, dodge about! cried the goose. Skip around, run toward me, slip in and out, in and out, in and out! Make for the woods, twist and turn! The cocker spaniel sprang for Wilbur's hind leg. Wilbur jumped and ran. Lurvy reached out and grabbed. Mrs. Zuckerman screamed at Lurvy. The goose cheered for Wilbur. Wilbur dodged between Lurvy's legs. Lurvy missed Wilbur and grabbed the spaniel instead. Nicely done, nicely done, cried the goose. Try it again, try it again. Run downhill, suggested the cows. Run toward me, yelled the gander. Run uphill, cried the sheep. Turn and twist, honked the goose. Jump and dance, said the rooster. Look out for Lurvy, called the cows. Look out for Zuckerman, yelled the gander. Watch out for the dog, cried the sheep. Listen to me, listen to me, screamed the goose. Poor Wilbur was dazed and frightened by this hullabaloo. He didn't like being the center of all this fuss. He tried to follow the instructions his friends were giving him, but he couldn't run downhill and uphill at the same time, and he couldn't turn and twist when he was jumping and dancing, and he was crying so hard he could barely see anything that was happening. After all, Wilbur was a very young pig, not much more than a baby, really. He wished Fern were there to take him in her arms and comfort him. When he looked up and saw Mr. Zuckerman standing quite close to him, holding a pail of warm slops, he felt relieved. He lifted his nose and sniffed. The smell was delicious. Warm milk, potato skins, wheat middlings, Kellogg's cornflakes, and a popover left from the Zuckerman's breakfast. Come, pig, said Mr. Zuckerman, tapping the pail. Come, pig. Wilbur took a step toward the pail. No, 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 said the goose. It's the old pail trick, Wilbur. Don't fall for it, don't fall for it. He's trying to lure you back into captivity, Ivity. He's appealing to your stomach. Wilbur didn't care. The food smelled appetizing. He took another step toward the pail. Pig, pig! said Mr. Zuckerman in a kind voice, and began walking slowly toward the barnyard, looking all about him innocently, as if he didn't know that a little white pig was following along behind him. You'll be sorry, 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 called the goose. Wilbur didn't care. He kept walking toward the pail of slops. You'll miss your freedom, honked the goose. An hour of freedom is worth a barrel of slops. Wilbur didn't care. When Mr. Zuckerman reached the pig pen, he climbed over the fence and poured the slops into the trough. Then he pulled the loose board away from the fence so that there was a wide hole for Wilbur to walk through. Reconsider! Reconsider! cried the goose. Wilbur paid no attention. He stepped through the fence into his yard. He walked to the trough and took a long drink of slops, sucking in the milk hungrily and chewing the pop over. It was good to be home again. While Wilbur ate, Lurvy fetched a hammer and some eight penny nails and nailed the board in place. Then he and Mr. Zuckerman leaned lazily on the fence, and Mr. Zuckerman scratched Wilbur's back with a stick. He's quite a pig, said Lurvy. Yes, he'll make a good pig, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur heard the words of praise. He felt the warm milk inside his stomach. He felt the pleasant rubbing of the stick along his itchy back. He felt peaceful and happy and sleepy. This had been a tiring afternoon.
It was still only about four o'clock, but Wilbur was ready for bed. I'm really too young to go out into the world alone, he thought as he lay down. Chapter 4 Loneliness The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of the downspouts. Rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans, too. His plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at 6.30. Skim milk, crusts, middlings, bits of doughnuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins, and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at 7.00. From seven to eight, Wilbur planned to have a talk with Templeton, the rat that lived under his trow. Talking with Templeton was not the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. From eight to nine, Wilbur planned to take a nap outdoors in the sun. From nine to eleven, he planned to dig a hole or trench and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From 11 to 12, he planned to stand still and watch flies on the boards, watch bees in the clover, and watch swallows in the air. 12 o'clock, lunchtime. Middlings, warm water, apple parings, meat gravy, carrot scrapings, meat scraps, stale hominy, and the wrapper off a package of cheese. Lunch would be over at 1. From 1 to 2, Wilbur planned to sleep. From two to three, he planned to scratch itchy places by rubbing against the fence. From three to four, he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive, and to wait for Fern. At four would come supper. Skim milk, provender leftover sandwich from Lurvy's lunchbox, prune skins, a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried potatoes, marmalade drippings, a little more of this, a little more of that, a piece of baked apple, a scrap of upside-down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He awoke at six and saw the rain, and it seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I get everything all beautifully planned out, and it has to go in rain, he said. For a while, he stood gloomily indoors. Then he walked to the door and looked out. Drops of rain struck his face. His yard was cold and wet. His trow had an inch of rainwater in it. Templeton was nowhere to be seen. Are you out there, Templeton? called Wilbur. There was no answer. Suddenly, Wilbur felt lonely and friendless. One day just like another, he groaned. I'm very young. I have no real friends here in the barn. It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon. And Fern won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly! And Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the banging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy. Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped the slop, scraped the pail, and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend. Someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in a corner of the sheepfold. Will you come over and play with me, he asked. Sorry, Sonny, sorry, said the goose. I'm sitting on my eggs, eight of them. Got to keep them toasty, oasty, oasty warm. I have to stay right here. I'm no flibberty, iberty, gibbet. I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I'm expecting ghostlings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers, said Wilbur bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. Will you please play with me, he asked. Certainly not, said the lamb. In the first place, I cannot get into your pen as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. 
Pigs mean less than nothing to me. What do you mean, less than nothing? replied Wilbur. I don't think there is any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. It's the lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can something be less than nothing? If there were something that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something, even though it's just a very little bit of something. But if nothing is nothing, then nothing has nothing that is less than it is. Oh, be quiet! said the lamb. Go play by yourself. I don't play with pigs. Sadly, Wilbur lay down and listened to the rain. Soon he saw the rat climbing down a slanting board that he used as a stairway. Will you play with me, Templeton? asked Wilbur. Play? said Templeton, twirling his whiskers. Play? I hardly know the meaning of the word. Well, said Wilbur, it means to have fun, to frolic, to run and skip and make merry. I never do those things if I can avoid them, replied the rat sourly. I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, spying, and hiding. I am a glutton, but not a merrymaker. Right now, I am on my way to your trough to eat your breakfast, since you haven't got sense enough to eat it yourself. And Templeton the rat crept stealthily along the wall and disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat. And he had things pretty much his own way. The tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trough without coming out into the open. He had tunnels and runways all over Mr. Zuckerman's farm and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually he slept during the daytime and was abroad only after dark. Wilbur watched him disappear into his tunnel. In a moment, he saw the rat's sharp nose poked out from underneath the wooden trow. Cautiously, Templeton pulled himself up over the edge of the trow. This was almost more than Wilbur could stand on this dreary, rainy day to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else. He knew Templeton was getting soaked out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down in the manure and sobbed. Late that afternoon, Lurvy went to Mr. Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He hasn't touched his food. Give him two spoonfuls of sulfur and a little molasses, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurvy caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness any more. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the sheep chewing their cuds, and occasionally the rattle of a cow chain up overhead. You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when, out of the darkness, came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded rather thin, but pleasant. Do you want a friend, Wilbur? it said. I'll be a friend to you. I've watched you all day, and I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. Where are you? And who are you? I'm right up here, said the voice. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed. Bye!